Hello everybody, uh, welcome to the SOIN webinar, or joint webinar, uh, with the UK Overseas Territories Special Interest Group and SOIN's Action 2030 Group. Uh, this webinar will be on approaches to addressing the climate emergency in the UK Overseas Territories. Uh, before I hand over to Katie Medcalf, who is the convener of the UK Overseas Territory Group, uh, to officially open the webinar, I just want to say that uh, we will be doing a Q&A session at the end of the webinar, so please do pop your questions into the Q&A box throughout, and we will look to answer those. Um, okay, without further ado, I will now hand over to... Apologies, I'm working from home. Um, I will now hand over to Katie, who will officially open the webinar. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Good day, everybody. A very warm welcome to this webinar, Approaches to Addressing the Climate Emergency in the UK Overseas Territories and the UK. This is the third and final webinar this year that the OVT SIG has run. And we're delighted to be running this webinar in conjunction with the SAIM Policy Group for Action 2030. For those of you who are not familiar with the Overseas Territories, the UK Overseas Territories are made up of 14 territories which are under the UK sovereignty, but not part of the UK itself. They're important because they boast more biodiversity than the entirety of mainland UK and include the three biodiversity hotspots of the Oceana Ecozone, the Caribbean Islands and the Mediterranean Basin. They're responsible for protecting this priceless biodiversity is shared between the UK government and the government of each um, territory. And the members of the UK Territory Special Interest Group volunteer their time um, to help and support these areas. Um, I've, sorry, <laughs> I slipped my slides by accident. Um, so today we're looking at nature-based solutions. I've been working on nature-based solutions for over eight years through Environment Systems Sense Spatial Evidence for Nature-Based Solutions tool. And it's a real privilege to chair this meeting today. Nature-based solutions could be regarded as where you're taking actions to manage, protect and restore natural ecosystems. And these actions are addressing a societal challenge. For example, somewhere that's flood prone or where there's um, climate change implications or food security, things like that. Natural ecosystems are extremely resilient to change, um, but um, such as extreme storm events, and they've often been modified um, in the past, reducing their resilience and um, degrading them further. Uh, examples of this are where you might have development near the coast and um, that's led to inappropriate modification of the coastal zone and of course that sort of development is often protected by these natural systems which are then taken away or eroded or poorly managed. So in this webinar we're going to explore how we can work to re-establish natural ecosystems in terms of coastal wetlands to provide benefits for communities in the UK overseas territories and in the UK. And then we're going to have a discussion to look at similarities, differences and best practice. The agenda, I'm going to hand over to Amber in a couple of seconds who's going to talk us through the 2030 action plan from, from SAIM. Amber's then going to hand over to Louise Soames from Roehampton University, who lives and works in the Caribbean Overseas Territories. And for this job, she was consultant to the Disaster Management Department in BVI. And she's going to talk about establishing flood resilient smart communities through NGO partnership project. And Louise is then going to hand over to Alice Laver, who's the site manager for the Strut Marshes in Somerset. And she's going to be talking about landscape scale wetland creation. And then we'll have a question and discussion session. If you think of a question 
um, do just type it in the question and answer box and then we can pick it up and talk about them at the end. You don't have to wait till the end to put your questions in the box. And without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand over to Amber. Thank you, Katie. Um, so I'm just going to share my presentation. Um, so I am the Policy and Communications Officer for SAIM um, and I'm leading on our response to the climate emergency and biodiversity crisis. Um, so just to start a little bit of background, um, in September 2019, we, like many other organisations, uh, declared a climate emergency and biodiversity crisis. So in this, we recognise that these two crisis, crises are inextricably linked and we can't address one without addressing the other. Um, and you also, they cannot be fully understood without reference to social issues as well. Um, so we published this declaration and we also published a briefing paper, both of which are available on our resources hub of our website. Um, and in the briefing paper, we acknowledge the two crises and how they are linked. And we acknowledge that nature-based solutions must play a key role in mitigating against and adapting to climate change, um, as well as reversing the on ongoing declines in biodiversity. Um, so to follow this up, this month, we've published a briefing on nature-based solutions. Um, and this mostly looks at what they are, how they work, and implementations and standards going forward, uh, for example, the IUCN. Uh, standards that they're producing. So this is also available at our resources hub on our website. So following on from the declaration, uh, we wanted to commit to a series of actions to address the joint crises as an organisation, uh, most notably committing to reach net zero in all of our activities by 2030 and to set up a working group called Action 2030. So the Action 2030 working group uh, they mostly challenge us as an organisation to reach our net zero target. Uh, they help us to identify how we can lead change in the profession to address these crises. So uh, although the ecology and environmental profession are largely environmentally positive um, sectors, there is quite high resource use across the sector. So looking at how we can address that, um, providing advice to our members on addressing the crisis, the crises together uh, through their professional work. They work to promote nature-based solutions and build relationships with other organisations and working groups because it's really important that we do this together. Um, so the first thing that the group looked at was helping us reach net zero. So they reviewed our existing environmental policy, which is available on our website, um, and from that agreed a proposed scope for net zero, which is all of the emissions that we're going to include in our uh, reporting. So these are split into scope one, two, and three, which scope one refers to uh, direct emissions from things that we own. Uh, scope two refers to direct emissions from things that we don't own, for example, pool cars or um, gas boilers. And then scope three refers to emissions from our supply chain. Um, and this, so scope one and two for us, because we purchase renewable energy, uh, according to UK government guidelines, we can report these as uh, zero percent basically <laughs> of our emissions so for us all of our emissions fall into scope three and so we will be including things like uh, staff and committee travel delegate travel to our conferences and training courses uh, the production of our in practice magazine uh, staff commuting energy uses of venues anything we can think of basically will hopefully be included um, in our reporting so the group have provided several key recommendations on how we can reach net zero, uh, which focus on remote working and uh, remote CPD options for our members wherever we can, um, incentives for sustainable commuting and influencing our providers further up the supply chain, for example, our pension provider, venues and in practice printers. So carbon emissions monitoring is a very detailed topic, so I'm, I don't have time to go into details here, but we do hope to hold a webinar on the 21st of August about how organisations can take their first steps to net zero, presenting our methods as an example and some industry best practice. So the group also looked at our offsetting. So currently we donate each year to a reputable conservation project in Britain or the island of Ireland. Uh, so this roughly equals £200 annually, and we've been doing this for about four years. Um, however, our current model does present a problem when we're looking to reach net zero because we don't actually know the exact amount of carbon being sequestered for every pound that we donate. 
So the Action 2030 group has recommended switching to an a accredited offsetting scheme where we can ensure that the CO2 emitted by SIEM as an organisation matches the CO2 absorbed over a year by a habitat that is being created. So the next sort of arm of the group is leading change in the profession. So the group presented a range of recommendations to our governance committees about how we can bring about change to address the climate emergency and biodiversity crisis amongst our members. So our governance committees have agreed to review the competency framework in 2021 to 22 to ensure that the competency framework adequately addresses uh, the crises and highlights any potential gaps currently. They will be reviewing our training offering to ensure that the programme covers all aspects of the joint crises um, and altering our CPD recording forms and training proposal forms to encourage reflection on how it addresses the joint crises. We will also be offering free webinars, templates for, uh, for reporting carbon and template letters for your providers. Um, and we intend to run a carbon neutral pledge campaign uh, in the new year, but this is obviously not a compulsory part of membership. It's just a, a way of drumming up interest in the topic and seeing if we can get some commitments from people to, to reduce their impact. So the final area is advice to members. Um, and so we will be offering advice for our members through a range of media um, on how to address the joint crises through their professional work. And this includes considerations in their advice to clients, for example, using an ecosystem approach um, and evaluating the carbon footprint of green interventions. Uh, looking at carbon sequestration value of habitats. So there is currently a need for updated evidence and um, joint up evidence across the UK and Ireland. Uh, but there will hopefully be an article on this in either December or March's in practice. Sorry, I can't remember which one it is. Um, so yeah, keep an eye out for that. And then we're also looking at materials and methods. So there's quite high single use plastic use in a, a range of ecological surveys and environmental management techniques. So looking at sustainable ecological solutions um, and alternatives to these single use plastics wherever possible. We'll also be looking at organisational management, for example, business travel, suppliers, uh, pension, etc. So a survey recently went out to our members um, and there'll be a follow up article in, in practice in the September edition. So please do keep an eye out for that as well. And then finally, signposting to personal actions. So this is just an aside. If our members are really keen and really interested in how they can uh, reduce their impact, then we'll just be signposting them to things that they could do as a person as well. So finally, if you'd like to find out more about the Action 2030 project, uh, the group members and the recommendations that will be coming out of the group, please do check out our Action 2030 webpage on our website. Um, so now I'm going to hand over to Louise, if I just stop sharing my screen. Okay, over to you, Louise. Louise, I think you're on mute. Hello? 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 We can hear you, but we can't see the screen yet. Okay, it's coming. Okay, can everyone hear my, see my screen now? Hello? Yes, that looks good. Yeah. And, okay. And everyone can hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to talk briefly about a project I've been working on in the British Virgin Islands, um, a project that was being managed by the Department of Disaster Management. Um, it's called Establishing Flood Resistant Smart Communities Through NGO Partnerships. So for you, those of you who don't know where the British Virgin Islands are, they're located in the, they're one of um, five UK overseas territories located in the Caribbean. And they're a collection of about 60 islands and rocky outcrops um, that make up the BVI with four main inhabited islands, Tortola being the, the largest, and then some smaller sister islands. So the overall aim of this project was to um, 
established flood resistant smart communities in the in the British Virgin Islands. And as I said, it was led by the Department of Disaster Management, but also in collaboration with um, several non-profit organizations such as Rotary Club, um, the Just Van Dyke Preservation Society, Lions Club and the Adventist Development Relief Agency. Now, smart communities are, are communities that are able to um, use sustained mitigation, adaptation, adaptation and resilient techniques to resist and, and um, recover from natural hazards. This can be things, this can be um, preparing the community or local businesses to be able to react and respond to hazards, and it, but it can also range to, to looking at things in the environment. So how, can, how resilient is your natural environment? How can it protect you and how will it respond to natural hazards? So why is it relevant to try and um, make communities smart in the BVI? Well, the BVI lies in the Atlantic hurricane belt, and in 2017, the Caribbean experienced the worst hurricane season on record. The first picture here is the island of Joss Van Dyke. This is a small island with about 300 people. Basically, basically got completely destroyed by Hurricane Irma in September 2017. And then following Hurricane Irma, Hurricane Maria and Jose came and they caused a lot of flooding. This is the main, the main um, capital of the British Virgin Islands, Tortola. A lot of flooding happened. So it's very relevant. Local communities, government agencies and local communities are very aware of the effect of natural hazards now. And we're all being told with climate change, these, these hazards will increase. There's quite a lot of support and um, a bit of understanding that, that we need to start doing something to try and mitigate the risks associated with these hazards that, should, that are likely to increase. So this project just focused on three, three of the communities in the British Virgin Islands as a, as a pilot scheme, really. So in 2014, Red Cross and DDM, Department of Disaster Management, conducted some vulnerability assessments of the communities of the BVI, and they ranked three different com three communities, Sea Cows Bay, East End Long Look on Tortola, the main island, and Joss Van Dyke as being the most are the most vulnerable communities in the BVI and these rankings were based on quite a number of factors for example like population demographics, um, the, the number of houses in low-lying areas that are likely to be flooded, the number of immigrants, um, things like this but these three communities were, were particularly vulnerable so this project focuses just on these three communities and the, the wider project um, it had many aspects from restoring hurricane shelters to um, installing uh, sediment traps in water channels, water guts to prevent flooding. What I'm gonna talk about here is just the component, component I was involved with, which was, which was the development of a sustainable mangrove plan for those communities. To try and encourage um, the protection and restoration of mangroves to increase coastal resiliency, and just to try and raise awareness within these communities about why it's important to have really good coastal ecosystems and how they can protect you in the future. So we took a, um, we worked with Environment Systems, Katie Medcalf at Environment Systems. Um, we took a, we, what we hope is a, a novel science-based approach to mangrove restoration. And it had three stages. First of all, we modeled the flood risk of these communities to storm surges and ground seas. Ground seas, for those of you who, who don't know, who don't live in the Caribbean, they're they're caused by extra tropical storms, so storms that originate outside of the tropics. But they have, these have major impacts on the, on the surge, the, the sea surge, and they can have really bad flooding effects in the winter months. So we modeled the flood risk from storm surges caused by hurricanes and also ground seas caused by these extra tropical storms. And the next stage was to map where mangroves really could be restored. So instead of going out doing mass mangrove replantings, maybe in areas that aren't so suitable or might not really work out, we wanted to really prioritize the areas for mangrove restoration in these three communities. And then the next stage of the project was to try and make people aware, the local communities aware and the local government agencies and policy makers of what kind of effect restoring mangroves would have on the local communities, which might make them more um, amenable to taking action and actually restoring these mangroves. So the first stage, as I said, was to model um, the exposure of the coastline and the coastal communities to flooding from hurricane seas. So we, we collected a lot of, we collected data from 
um, all the hurricanes that have passed within 100, 100 miles up to of the British Virgin Islands and their strength and the direction that these came in to give different weightings, different, different weightings to the direction. So you can see here the most predominant um, storm set, the most predominant, predominant direction of hurricanes is north, north is south, southeast, highlighted by the darker red areas. Those areas are more prone to flooding than the lighter red areas. This is caused by hurricanes. And we did the same for the ground seas. So the ground seas come more from a north, northeast direction. So the, nor the northern coastline is more prone to flooding from the ground seas. And the southern side of the Virgin Islands, is the main island here, Tortola, is a bit more protected. So, so we, we focused in on the three different communities to highlight the, the storm surge effects. So people could actually see where people experience these floods every year, but it's good to see as well, good to visualize. So here we see, this is a Sea Cows Bay community. The first map shows um, the risk of flooding to, to hurricane storms. So red um, is very high to extreme risk of flooding in the first map. And the second map here is the risk of flooding to ground sea. So the, the Sea Cows Bay community is at very high risk of flooding from storms, hurricane storms, but a bit of a lesser risk from ground seas just because of its location. The next community, East End Long Look, again, quite high, very high risk from storm surges and also quite moderate to high risk from ground seas. And the island of Joss Van Dyke, because of its location, more northerly location, it's a bit more protected by Tortola, so it doesn't, it has a some to moderate risk of flooding from storm surge, but because of its northern location, it actually suffers more from ground seas, flooding from ground seas. And then the next stage we built into this was to identify areas around the coastline where mangroves could, could be planted or restored or should be protected. So we had to combine, we combined a lot of um, ecological data to make these maps, including habitat layers, pond locations, slope data, elevation, and the flood risk models. So these areas highlighted in orange are areas suitable for mangrove restoration on the main island of Tortola. But we, made, we created maps again for the three different communities to make it easier for local communities to visualize and maybe take action. So the first map here, map A, shows opportunity areas for red mangroves restoration. The red mangroves have um, the highest tolerance of salt, salty conditions, so they can grow closest to the, the sea. And the next map B is for buttonwood restoration, which is, although not a true mangrove, it grows in association with the other species and it has the least tolerance for salt. Um, salty conditions. So we've created the, an envelope. Anything in between these areas can be good for mangrove species to grow in. So any areas in darker red are really high opportunity areas and area lighter pink are some opportunity. I mean, they're not as good, but they're still worth investigating or trying to do some planting. So these are the areas for Sea Cows Bay and East End Long Look. And then also for Joss Van Dyke. Yeah. Then the next stage was to, cons to try and make people aware of what would happen if you did restore or replant all these mangroves in the areas that we identified. What, would, what effect would that actually have on your communities? How would it reduce flooding to your, to your communities? So we, the model was run twice. It was a baseline model um, pre-Hurricane Irma Maria with existing mangrove locations. And then we added in where if all the mangroves if all the mangrove opportunity areas were restored, what kind of effect would that have when we compared the two scenarios? And this created maps like this with the three communities. So in the green here, that's areas where the mangroves could be replanted, the opportunity areas, and they, all the areas highlighted in pink are areas that we predict will have received flood protection from just restoring those mangroves alone. So you can see it can, um, the flood protection goes in about, I think it's about four, 400 meters, maybe further. Some areas that can, will benefit more than others, but you can see there's the whole coastline really, the whole coastline of this community could benefit from just very, very small scale mangrove restoration. So that's Sea Cows Bay. And then we also, um, this is the same map, but instead of highlighting the areas in pink, we've actually highlighted homes and buildings that would receive protection from mangrove restoration. So you can actually if you lived in this community, you could actually see if your home or school or church could be potentially protected just from 
replanting mangroves. We've made the same maps for the East End Long Look. And again, highlighted the houses, any infrastructure that would be protected. And again, we did the same for Joss Van Dyke. And again, highlighted all the, all the infrastructure that would be protected. So you think this, is, this provides a really good tool for um, local NGOs or governments to go out and try and talk to local communities about mangrove restoration and make them really aware of what the benefits can be instead of just hearing, we hear all the time climate change is happening, storms will increase, um, we'll get more flooding, sea level rise, but this actually helps local communities visualize what kind of impact just really small scale restoration could have to their lives and to, to their homes, buildings, churches. So we hope this will be a really good tool um, for the future. As part of the project as well, we'd help to establish some mangrove nurseries. Um, we've worked closely with the Joss Van Dyke Preservation Society, who've already, who are leading the way in um, mangrove restoration in the territory. They've already set up a shade house and a school program to grow mangroves and doing some new plantings. We're working with um, a youth, the Youth Empowerment Program in Tortola to do the same. We've created some infographics and educational materials that can be shared such as these just to try and raise awareness um, and get people into restoring the mangroves so the next stage for this is to we've we've highlighted all these areas they've got they need to be prioritized now for restoration work that there's two um, mangrove nurseries already established growing plants for replanting so we can get them out Local agencies will be getting them out as soon as they can. Um, we can also use these maps to lobby local government to maybe protect these areas, buy land maybe, um, to protect the really pro the priority areas. And then the next stage, we just looked at mangroves in this project, but really we've got to consider the reef to ridge approach. So we've got to, this map here is not the BBI, it's Anguilla, the nearby island of Anguilla. And there's a sim we have a similar project running here, which is modeling opportunity areas and creating the similar maps, um, from not just for mangroves, but inland forests and coral reefs and sand dunes. So we're looking at all different habitat types and restoration activities to see how we can really build the, coast, the resilience of the coastline of Anguilla. So in the BBI as well, we could, this work could be expanded to look at all the different coastal ecosystems to just really, really build the resilience of the coastlines and the community. And that's a quick summary. I'm sat with the Anguilla National Trust now as well, if anyone has any questions about the work they're doing in Anguilla on the, on the wider reef to ridge approach. Yes. And then. Thanks, Louise, that was great. If anyone has any questions, do write them in the Q&A box and we'll pick them up at the end. Um, and then if you're happy, Louise, to hand over to Alice. Yeah, here we go. So I've come off, so next is Alice. Thank you, Louise. Hopefully you can all hear me okay. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm to talk to you about uh, Steart Marshes, which is a um, big managed realignment scheme that was started in 2009. Can you hear me? Yes, yep. you're, you're, you're coming through well. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to talk to you about the creation and design of sort of the landscape scale wetlands the ecosystem services and sort of the value of wetlands and how we've been measuring that and communicating it and the management and demonstration of those sort of messages to our visitors and sort of key audiences. So this is a, an aerial that I use a lot. It was taken on the first tidal inundation in September 2014. So at the end of the sort of uh, vine sort of uh, pattern, you've got the breach. So you've got the river parrot on the right hand side of the screen and then you've got the Bristol Channel at the top so the peninsula sticks out right at the confluence of, of sort of the seven estuary. Okay so I always like to explain sort of where 
where we're based. So you can see here we're at the Bristol Channel and you zoom in. And like I say, just we're sort of in, uh, in Somerset and with this sort of toe of land, this peninsula sticking out into the Bristol Channel. We're obviously a big, big part of the uh, Seven Estuary, which is given um, those got highly designated. I'm getting terrible feedback. Hi Alice, yeah, we are too. Um, have you got anything else on, like a speaker or anything you can turn off? No, nothing at all. No. Sometimes, Alice, if you mute and unmute, it sorts itself out. It's always worth trying. All right, I've given that a go. I'll try now. <laughs> um, so yes, I was just saying the seven estuary, so we're part of the seven estuary, uh, known to hold all sorts of important designations because of the uh, special plants, so the salt marsh plants and also the wintering birds that it supports um, and also it's got a Ramsar designation so really really um, really important part of the UK um, and it also has one of the second sort of largest tidal ranges in the world so anything up to, to 15 meters so it's a really dynamic part um, of the estuary itself. So one of the key things in actually First and foremost in having sort of, uh, sort of landscape scale well in creation is having the driver behind it. So the, the driver behind Steart Marshes was uh, climate change and habitat that was being lost due to rising sea levels and through uh, a mechanism known as coastal squeeze. So I'm sure most of you are aware that this is where you've got the embankment, which you can see on the right hand side which the Environment Agency would continue to maintain to protect businesses and, and properties behind it. In natural circumstances, the, the salt marsh would naturally encroach in land. The embankment being there actually doesn't, you know, prevents this from happening. So as sea level rises, the upper salt marsh, particularly the Atlantic salt marsh, actually gets squeezed out of existence. So the whole driver behind Steart Marshes was the Environment Agency having to compensate for losses up to 2025. So it's just looking at the first epoch. So obviously there's the second and the third epochs to also consider, but that was the main driver behind it. Um, and this allowed for it to be funded. So they don't come cheap. So this was 20.7 million pounds uh, with Steart Marshes and eight million pounds of that was through land acquisition. So um, also location is obviously key when you're trying to think of habitat creation, particularly wetlands. So a low lying peninsula sticking right out into the Seven Estuary, the Bristol Channel was an absolutely ideal location. Um, it's an area that has been looked, you know, had a, um, different organisations have been keeping an eye on for decades, I'm told. But again, you just needed the right driver to come along at the right time. Um, what also helps is if you've got the risk Factor. So this is a picture taken from 1981. So this illustrates that the, the river, the, the old parrot banks were already failing. So all that area that you can see flooded was actually farmland. So this obviously puts not only the farmland at risk, making it less and less usable, but also we've got three villages on the periphery of the reserve um, and they were also at risk of flooding. So the community is is obviously it, it benefits the local community and they were they were keen for it to go ahead so again i'm sure most of you know uh, what is entailed with managed realignment but you can see we've got the old seawall that runs along the parrot banks and we've set that back and you can kind of see this is an artist's impression but you can see you set the defenses right back which creates this huge area um, that can then sort of start being inundated with tidal waters and start creating the salt marsh habitats. So at the same time, even though the driver was habitat creation, what you can do and what the Environment Agency did was actually raise the sea defences. So you've got improved uh, flood protection to the local communities as well. So it's sort of an added benefit of that habitat creation. Design and construction process, it does take a a surprisingly long amount of time. So you can see through here, sort of going through bids, so it was put to tender, so WWT, um, wetland charity, so they did have to go to tender and we were sort of successful in that. 
the key most one of the most important parts of the whole process was community consultation which is why i found louise's presentation particularly interesting because without the local community on board um, it can become near on impossible to sort of have these these sort of projects sort of come to fruition um, and that remains important even to this day so once you've got sort of the stakeholders and people on board you've got to make sure that your protected species are mitigated for um, get your planning approvals there was lots of uh, footpaths cutting through it um, and then the construction itself and then deciding who's going to manage it so the environment agency still own the land um, it's 477 hectares in total of different types of habitat but we are managing it on their behalf which so it's a partnership scheme that's working really really well so one of the first questions i had when i started was how you even start beginning to design uh, a complex sort of wetland especially on that sort of scale and the first first thing you do is you look at the land that you're working with so we use lidar so this lets us know the height of the land so the red areas are much higher areas of land so this is where you get your villages so we've got one at the north known as steert and then we've got stockland bristol and we've got cummage at the southern end you then get your oranges and your yellows and these are sort of slightly lower and then those areas of sort of light blue going down to dark blue they're much much lower so what we do is we work with the land so the uh, sort of uh, sorry the bottom sort of the right hand side left hand side sorry where you've got that blue that's an area that we actually flood naturally in the winter and then some other blue areas that you can see further over sort of in the center of the, the slide is where we've sort of created saline lagoons. So what you find is you're working with nature, you're working with gravity um, and you're not having to do any pumping. So it's sustainable and, and it's much, much, much easier to manage. You then have to look at what's on the ground. So we've got a single road that goes up to the village of Steer that clearly had to be protected to, to uh, enable access to continue. And then we've also got a high voltage, the yellow line that's going through from left to right. That's a high voltage power line that's coming from the power station. So this obviously has to be protected as well. So this sort of naturally cut the area into the, the different quarters that you can see there. You then get the engineers doing what they do brilliantly. So you get your final design and they put it all on uh, CAD, computer aided design. Um, and you have those, all of those computers then speaking to the machines on the ground. And you can see here, they sort of copy like for like uh, onto the ground to create what this is the actual creek system. So you can see here where we're kind of stood just of where the area was before the breach happened. So what we've got, uh, now to manage is um, we've got uh, sort of a large large scale sort of wetland with three main areas you can see we've got an intertidal area so that's 260 hectares of brand new uh, salt marsh area this is open to the sea the entire time it only inundates about 100 times a year because of the height of the land and you've also got to consider that you know you are creating atlantic salt marsh so it's naturally inundated less frequently uh, than say your mud flats and whatnot we've then got a brackish area so this is tidal but it's regulated so that means it comes the tide waters come through a series of structures and we're then able to actually hold back the tidal waters and create saline lagoons and then depending on the weather conditions whether it's sunny or rainy that affects the salinity um, this has by far been the most productive area of the site in terms of breeding waders um, and saline lagoons are an extremely rare habitat and still still diminishing now. Uh, and then we've got a freshwater area. So not only, you know, freshwater area, this was partly to mitigate for the freshwater areas that were, were lost during the creation of the scheme, um, but also having a freshwater area near the coastline always brings in sort of really uh, valuable wildlife. And to have that sort of mosaic of habitats just means not only does it allow, having a landscape scale wetland not only allows for greater diversity, which obviously benefits more species, but it means that the site is more adaptable and more resilient to climate change. So depending on whatever extremes we're going through, there's always parts of the site that will 
cope with those changes and when other site when other parts of the site might not be doing so well so that scale is absolutely key to that resilience so in terms of management we've got five members of staff so there's myself as the site manager we've got three reserve wardens and then we've got an engagement officer um, and over 60 volunteers so without those volunteers we wouldn't be able to achieve even you know an ounce of, of what we do in terms of managing the site just because of the, the scale of it um, a lot of those volunteers are local um, some are local uh, students from local colleges and others are retired so it's a really good way of engaging with people um, but also giving that ownership to the local community and they do everything from practical work surveys engagement sort of running walks and talks um, and it's just it's a fantastic relationship and that's something that the engagement officer manages we've then got to i've got to make sure that the land is managed in accordance with our agri environment scheme so we get paid we're, we're in an hls scheme so we get paid to manage the land in a certain way um, and that is our main source of income so as a charity we cannot we couldn't put the charity at risk. So Steart Marshes has to be self-sustaining in terms of income. So that, that sort of supports uh, the majority of our works. I've already mentioned the relationship with the local community. We have regular forums, so quarterly forums. We meet up um, with the local community and all the stakeholders. And I think that has been one of the most valuable lessons that I think we've learned. So not only is it ourselves um, and the local community? You've also got Natural England, you've got the environment agencies. So you've got people from every single level um, that means that when issues do arise, they can be dealt with in, uh, in, a, in an efficient manner and people feel like they're being listened to. So that's been, yeah, one of the most important lessons learned. Um, we've also got our visitors now. So we have on average about 50,000 visitations a year something that we have to manage very very carefully because of the local community they don't want hundreds of thousands of visitors on their doorstep um, so what we do do is it's very focused engagement and all of our walks and talks and anything we do on site is all um, gauged around communicating the value of wetlands and making trying to make sure people take something home um, in terms of learning about what wetlands do for them and a key, one of the most important parts of that is the monitoring and research. So the research not only provides us with evidence, but it also feeds into land management, obviously lets us know when we're, if anything's not going as it should do, but it also obviously a key part of the engagement because we know what's going on. Um, it's been one of the most surprising things I've come across is uh, sort of visiting other managed realignment schemes is the lack of research after schemes are completed and i think that's something that people really want to change um, so we've been lucky enough to have monitoring sort of pre-breach so you can see the changes right from day one so in terms of the the monitoring we've had we had an agreement with the environment agency so you have to make sure the protected species have actually um, been successful in the mitigation but also the whole reason that the habitat was deemed important the atlantic salt marsh is because of the wintering birds and the salt marsh habitat so you have to make sure that it's going in the right direction so we have to that's a key part of what we we're monitoring we've also had multiple phd projects to help provide evidence for our natural capital accounts so things like carbon capture um, fisheries all those sorts of things and then we've obviously got our own approach as an organization because we're interested to see how the habitat is developing and this is things like your butterfly monitoring, breeding bird surveys, dragonfly surveys, so everything just to sort of provide the evidence so that we know that it's, that it's a success. So I've already said, we, we talked about ecosystem services. So we've coined this phrase uh, called working wetlands. So we're trying to talk to people about the benefits, not only for the wildlife, but also to the people. So there's sort of two arms to this. There's the risk reduction side of things. So we know that we're protecting properties, local properties from tidal flooding. We're able to store floodwaters during the winter. So, um, and we do that by actually not only creating massive lakes that all the wintering birds can then make the most of, but we can actually divert uh, floodwater through the reserve and out 
um, to sort of alleviate the pressures on the local ditch network. And this is, we've got a really good relationship with the internal drainage board. Um, and this not only helps protect properties, but also the farmland on the periphery of the reserve. And then the salt marsh itself, much like uh, the mangroves that you've already heard about, actually absorbs the wave energy and actually helps protect the flood defense itself. So that's got a, got a value. We've also then looking at the natural wealth of the wetlands themselves. So we've been looking at carbon capture, so blue carbon. We've got um, the, the site is being grazed by five local farmers. And in that grazing, you get the production of salt marsh beef and lamb. Um, and you cannot underestimate the food in terms of engaging with people when they want to see the value of the land itself. Um, health and well-being, that's become even more important. We've noticed in the last few months with the current situation that we are getting a whole different type of visitor and people are definitely uh, appreciating being outdoors a lot more. There's improving water quality, you know, you're slowing the flow and plants are taking all sorts of things out. And then also as the salt marsh develops, we know that we're getting sea bass um, fry and things riding in on the tide and that in itself comes with its own sort of high economic value but a big focus for steers at the moment has been sort of the carbon storage side of things because that's something that we've got most of the data on so WWT we've got someone who works in advocacy and policy um, and so it goes all the way up so we're looking at sort of three blue infrastructure proposals to take to government so we've got our carbon storage network, our flood protection network, and our urban well-being. And as I said, Steart Marshes is very much the carbon storage side of things. So we, we know that uh, wetlands store and bury far more amount, uh, a lot more carbon than say your sort of forests and trees. Um, and it's also a lot quicker. So if you want fast, if you want your benefits quickly, wetlands are definitely the way forward. Um, so again, our scientists, we've been working very closely with Manchester Metropolitan University and they've been using LIDAR images to work out uh, the accumulation of the silt. So we've got data up until 2017 and we're currently working on more uh, recent data. So we know that it's already accumulated between 17 and 23,000 tonnes of carbon since the breach. Um, so what we're trying to do now is working on papers, much <laughs> like a lot of other NGOs, um, and trying to align our own aims with the government. So um, we, want, we want managed realignment to be recognised as a sort of major contribution to the carbon targets. And our own objectives, as you can see, are creating sort of more wetlands by 2015, sort of. And it's not just us doing that. We want to sort of build capacity. So on an advisory role or opportunity mapping to sort of see other areas where these can be created, but also working with local communities and helping them care for the, the wetlands that are on their doorsteps, because you need that buy-in at every single level. So what we're doing is, you know, engaging with key audiences, and this is, a, this is sort of a process that we work through, and this sort of process works from our day-to-day -day visitors who come just for a walk um, right up to our policy people who can make changes in policy so we have um, lots of universities coming who use the use the uh, site as a classroom but also we've had ministers come to site and we just think it's just trying to raise awareness and get that connection to wetlands so people then want to bring around change that's a key part of what we're doing now and what the site is being used for um, and then finally you know our vision is a world where healthy wetland nature thrives and enriches lives and for some people the, the, the wildlife is enough but you know if you want to get sort of ears pricked up for people who can make those changes we need to start breaking it into monetary terms so this is a very rough figure that was produced for the environment agency but we're actually starting to hone in on a much more accurate figure as we're starting to get more and more data come in um, and that's that's the direction that we're sort of taking steer marshes and hoping to create more. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Alice. I'll stop sharing. <laughs> and I will start sharing.
Great. So um, I'm going to hand back over now to um, Amber for the discussion. Thanks, Katie. Um, so we've had a couple of questions in. Uh, the first one is for Louise. Um, Lauren Rose says, great talk. Um, I was wondering how you determined which areas were appropriate for the mangroves. Um, Katie might be able to speak to more about this as well because she actually did the modelling, but we just combined a lot of data. So we had soil type data, existing habitat data, elevation data, um, landform data, all the, any data we had for, for the BVI, we um, put that all in and we, we ranked um, different scenarios as being more suitable or less suitable for mangrove restoration. So we know they can only grow up to a certain depth into the sea and away from the sea. We know they, uh, they need what kind of substrate they need to grow on. Um, we know they're more likely to grow where there's already existing mangroves or close to a pond. So all of these factors were put into the model to, to create the opportunity areas. Kate, is there anything you want to add to that, Katie? No, nope, you explained it very well. Thank you. Um, and we've got another question in, which is for both Louise and Alice. Um, I'll come to Alice first. Um, Ari, the mangrove restoration and wetland restoration, uh, did you encounter any local resistance during planning stages? And if so, what were the main reasons and how did you address the issues? Uh, yes, yeah, we did definitely come across local resistance. Um, the main issues, I think, first and foremost, is it's that it's such a major change. So people are losing what they've known. But I think the biggest concern with the local communities was visit visitors. So we've got a single track road. Uh, we're known for Slimbridge, which is a big wetland centre. We get hundreds of thousands of visitors every year and they were very concerned that we were going to bring in another Slimbridge. So that was one of the key parts of us taking on the management is I have to be very careful in how we promote the site even now to make sure that we don't, um, yeah, so we don't get too many visitors um, and we've got no need to. It's a free entry site, so we don't get any money from our visitors. So it's 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 a tricky balance, but it's it's currently working. Um, and other concerns were just loss of access. So the ways that we addressed that were the stakeholder and community consultation meetings, I'm told, were questions. So it was a two way conversation rather than, than them being sat down and told what was going to happen. And through those conversations, we changed permissions of paths. So they maintained uh, areas that weren't necessarily going to have, they were going to have access to. And then even things like a local memorial pond for a farmer's son, which was going to be uh, a pond that was going to be sort of captured in the intertidal area. The whole line of the flood bank actually changed to make sure that that wasn't lost. So it's just, yeah, listening and making little changes makes them feel like they're being valued um, and even to this day that's the most important thing probably the hardest part of my job but one of the most important as well great thank you um, and louise did you come across any um objections to the planning stages um so we're quite an early stage in bbi so our local partner the joss van dyke preservation society has done some small scale restoration at existing mangrove site and just working with one landowner um, so to, to try and pilot it and show show what kind of work will be involved but it will involve it will involve the same the, the local partners would have to go and speak to individual landowners but we hope with by, by being able to show the maps the flood risk maps that they'll be more um, keen to support any rest of any new planting or any restoration activities but it will um, like Alice said it would be speaking to one-on-one -on -one meetings with landowners trying to get their support Great, thank you. Uh, so the next one, I guess, is for everyone. Um, given the current climate emergency and biodiversity crisis, uh, where would you say the largest knowledge gaps are? Um, Katie, would you like to jump in from an overseas territories point of view on that? Or So um, there's still quite a lot of knowledge gaps in terms of individual 
and really important data sets that you need to do this sort of action and quite a lot of these are modeled at the moment um, and I think looking forward the biggest knowledge gap in terms of the climate emergency is understanding the impacts on individual systems when they're um, disturbed time after time and um, that's going to be quite interesting trying to build a model which will fit those um, and look at those uh, in the overseas territories where uh, storm events are very hard to predict it's hard to predict where the hurricane will go um, and it's hard to predict how often they'll come through uh, so um, and that's without the ground seas so that's I think there's still a lot we need to understand um, even simple things like um, yeah how long between perturbations do these natural systems recover that type of thing great thank you um alice did you want to add anything to that um yeah yeah definitely i think funny enough we're just looking we're just about to have we have an annual research day and we're going to have another one looking at current sort of knowledge gaps and i think what we've been astounded at is just focusing on the carbon storage is just the lack of knowledge there and the amount of wetlands being created and then the benefits not being measured and um, it seems to be there's a lot of there's a lot of um drive behind peatlands which is great and there's a lot of drive behind uh, trees and forests and planting trees but we found that the coastal uh habitats just seem to be completely missed off um, so we're really trying to push with that at the moment because it's obviously it's it's a worldwide problem and uh, there's there's some quite easy quick wins there. Absolutely, um, Louise, did you want to add anything as well? Um, yeah, like Katie said, if there's um, additional information, ecological information that Katie would need to re refine these models to make them even more. Um, robust and effective at predicting the benefits and also in Anguilla we're we're just tr trying to trial some restoration of sand dunes well different coastal habitats and we're just trying to work it all out so it's not really that's not really a modeling side but we're just trying to work out the best techniques for restoration that will that will work and will work out in the long term and, and resist hurricane any potential hurricane damage so that's what we're trying to face at the moment. Thank you everyone um, and I guess we could add sort of opportunity mapping as well. Um, I know Alice mentioned tree planting but making sure that um, our response to the climate emergencies fit with biodiversity um, responses as well um, so we're not creating mono habitats or, or things like that and making sure it's all strategically done and in the right places. Um, yeah so thank you for that question that was Lauren Rose again. Um, so we've got Another question for Louise. Uh, how long before the planted mangroves provide hurricane protection and what caused the mangrove loss in the first place? Um, so the mangrove loss was caused by a category five hurricane. So one of the strongest hurricanes ever recorded in the, in the Atlantic. So, I mean, it caused massive destruction to many islands, but BVI, it caused particular damage to the adult ma red mangroves, so 90% of adult red mangroves were destroyed in that storm. So normally there'll be some loss or some damage, but this, this hurricane, Hurricane Irma, actually killed the mangroves, killed the adult trees. And that meant there's, and normally mangroves can um, re-establish themselves quite, quite well after small scale storm events. They can, there'll be some propagules from forest, seedlings from forest that will, can be, that will float down or be moved down and can help with the restoration but there were because there was so much damage of adult trees that there's just no new propagules growing so there's no new regeneration in the seed bank of a mangrove forest it does they don't really hold the seeds in the soil very well or invasive species that we've seen started seeing invasive species come in as well so that's why it got so damaged and it's not really recovering itself because it got so damaged because it's such a strong storm um, it will, and we're just planting seedlings now, so that it will take a long time. I'm not sure. In really good optimum habitats, you, they can grow quite quickly. 
Um, in Grenada, they, they, they showed some, they've got some pictures within five, or five and 10 years, you can get big mangrove trees again in, from replanting small ones, but it just depends on the conditions. If we get any more big storms, um, if they get cut down, a lot of different things, but it will take a while and probably we're gonna have some storms before they're fully recovered. So we just have to see, and then it, the, we can't just go out and plant once, we've gotta be going to these sites every, monitoring them frequently, replenishing them when they need to. Um, that's why we're setting up nurseries, so we've got backup mangroves to put in when we need to, as and when we need to. Brilliant, thank yeah. you. Um, and then the final question uh, is for Alice. Um, so there was a slide showing the scale of blue carbon capture compared to terrestrial habitats. Um, are there any comments on this? And could the reference to, be, to this be circulated, please? And that's from John Box. Yeah, I can, I can type the reference in if it's easier. I, try, I obviously can't get to my presentation when we're, when we're on this screen, but I'm happy to put it in now if that helps. Um, I think the uh, presentation will be uploaded afterwards onto the resource hub as well, so we can include the reference in that one. Yeah, it's in the, it's in the bottom of um, the slide that he's talking about. It's at the bottom of that slide, so you should be able to get the additional information from that. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so that is all the questions that have come in. Um, so unless there are any others at the last second, I will pass back over to Katie. Thank you very much. It's been a really interesting um, webinar. Thank you so much to Amber and Louise and Alice. Really interesting talks and excellent to see um, the importance of wetlands, the importance of coastal protection and really the synergies of um, the um, issues uh, both in the UK and in the British Overseas Territories. Even if the ecological systems are very different, the wetlands are still doing the same sort of things and the issues and synergies are, are similar. And it's great to be able to discuss them together and to learn from each other. So once again, thank you very much. And thank you all very much for listening. Uh, it's been great to have you with us. Uh, and that remains for me to say goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Katie, as well. Thank you.